Okay, I think uh, you know time is short. Uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, uh, so we're just going to get started with the panel session. I think the first thing I want to do is actually thank the organizers. When I spoke with the panel, I realized how finely or how well balanced uh, all of the people on the panel are today. You know, we have got representatives with experience in VC, private equity, CVC, as well as those who have actually run, started their own startups. So I think today's session is, uh, on this panel is really going to be very interesting. My name is Sien Hui. I head venture investing for SG Innovate. SG Innovate, as some of you may know, is an early stage uh, deep tech uh, investor uh, backed by the Singapore government. Uh, our investment thesis is grounded on the fact that we believe that deep tech can solve in part or in whole some of the biggest existential problems that are faced by the world today. So that's my personal bias, that's my personal interest. I'm sure that my fellow panelists have got different uh, points of view as well. Um, I have been, it has been requested of me to reverse the usual flow of introductions and therefore I'm actually going to start with the guys first and end with, uh, with the lady. Yeah. So I will hand it to Nico to introduce himself and what he does. Hi, I'm Nico uh, Wijaya. Uh, we just launched BRI Ventures uh, two months ago. That's the, the logo. Oh, that's the logo right there. <laughs> uh, formerly, I was uh, with Telkom Indonesia with MDI Ventures for five years. So um, uh, I guess you know Indonesia is is Indonesia's corporate. I mean, is getting ready and arming up for the uh, the next revolution, which is. Um, fintech and new retail. Um, so what I'm about to, uh, to share here is, uh, is perhaps some case studies from MDI Ventures as well because you know, we, at, at BRI Ventures we are, we are still building infrastructures to, uh, to do what exactly MDI did in the past uh, four or five years. So yeah. Jeremy? My name is Jeremy. I'm a co-founder of Teen Man Capital. Um, so who are we, Tin Man Capital? Um, in short, we are Tin Miners. I'm not sure how many of you, let's show of hands, have actually seen a Tin Ore up close and personal. It's actually not very impressive. It's uh, dull, gray, and it's a lot, it, it actually, it's a met metaphor to our investment beliefs and our thesis, right? And we understand what we invest in is not the finished product, just like a Tin Ore. But we work side by side with founders, we get involved in the business, and we help create value that's shared with everyone. Um, and I think about Tino is that it doesn't glitter, right? Unlike you know, our unicorn friends who are attracting a lot of capital, we back companies exclusively in the enterprise tech space, which we think is underserved. And finally, Tin is available in um, uh, you know, some abundance in Southeast Asia. And that's who we are, we only focus in Southeast Asia. The three of us, um, that's Ben, who is a repeat entrepreneur, and then there's Muli, who is head of uh, South Asia for Jeffco previously, and there's me, who has uh, been in private equity, and my last job was running uh, investments and uh, strategy for a large commodities firm. Uh, between the three of us, we like to think that we have the experience and expertise to be um, of service to our founders along their journey. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Nir Arbel. Uh, I'm the operating partner for ESCO Ventures. Uh, my background is actually a scientist, so I, I went into ventures starting out actually as a, as a scientist. Uh, I've been working in the startup space in healthcare uh, for the last 10 years and joined ESCO Ventures uh, roughly four or five years ago and actually helped structure um, ESCO Ventures. So ESCO Ventures is the operating or, or um, investment arm for ESCO Micro, which is a life science tool and medical device equipment based in Singapore, now selling in 100 countries around the world. And, and what we did in ESCO Ventures is we uh, started out with making uh, initial early stage investments in various countries around the world, whether in Israel, US, or Singapore. And what this model has actually evolved, so we have a, quite a lot of flexibility being the venture arm of a, of a company, uh, so we actually evolved now to much more of a venture creation model where we build up our own companies based on what we see as the unmet needs in the healthcare space. Thanks, Nia. So finally, Edith. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, no, no ladies first. Uh, my name is Edith Young. I am um, actually one of the co-founders for Proof of Capital. We are a fintech and blockchain focused fund, uh, focused on early stage up to A. Uh, previously, I was at 500 startups focused on uh, China. For Proof of Capital, we think there's a lot of really exciting opportunities, uh, particular with sort of the rise of digital, digital currency, um, which we can touch on a little bit more later on. Okay, thanks, Edith. So let's get into the meat of the panel uh, topic itself, which is basically investing to future unicorns and tapping growth drivers of tomorrow. I think from the previous session, you probably heard of, uh, derived the sense that the concept of a unicorn is actually a, a slightly artificial construct. So I think uh, we will not focus too much on how you know, different valuations can sort of artificially push a value of a company to unicorn status. Uh, and rather focus on whether or not where the best companies are uh, going to be uh, you know, based on the future growth drivers. So this time I am going to go ladies first. So Edith, I'm going to ask you, where do you think uh, you know, the growth drivers of tomorrow are likely to be? Um, so I don't know how many of you actually have paid attention. I think one of the super in interesting driver, thanks to Facebook, with the announcement wanting to launch Libra, it really actually get a lot of governments around the world, and you know, starting with China. Um, in many ways, I think, you know, actually, Chinese government very, very clear to say the fact that you know, in the basket of the currency that Libra support, uh, RMB is not one of them. And when when a tech company basically trying to potentially challenge the authorities and the control of central bank, you definitely see a lot of really interesting movement, I think, in that ad. So we've been paying a lot of attention on, you know, if, if you actually look at some of the announcement that, you know, the PBOC, the uh, People Bank of China have made, that they have, they've been really, really thoughtful about how they potentially actually designed it. Just on the sort of the two layer system, how PBOC will work with a very specific bank plus Alibaba and Tencent, and then how they actually want some of these banks to distribute sort of the digital RMB to, to businesses and, and, and the citizens. And it's really fascinating for us to see, it's not just for sort of the cool crypto buzzword, it's really rethinking, particularly in the fintech space, how can you be faster and cheaper for consumer payment, interbank clearing, um, and then across border payments. I think there's a lot of really, really exciting things where we are already seeing sort of the parallel universe that regardless in, on the infrastructure side, on exchanges, custody, or you know, a lot of front end, back end. Of course, if you talk about money, you really need to rethink about privacy and security. So we're very, very excited about, in some way, thanks to Facebook, now, everybody is thinking about it, and we absolutely think that Asia will be way ahead of the game than the developed country like US and Europe. So I'll just follow up on, on that, sir, because the, there's a little bit of time on, uh, for us. So the French, a French minister recently came out and said that Libra would be implemented in France over his dead body. A bit of an exaggeration maybe, but you know, so obviously the acceptance of a of currency, a global currency which is unfettered by the, 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 the oversight of central banks is going to be a problem for, uh, you know, for this, uh, this new uh, digitization of, of currency. So what is your funds take or your personal take on that? So I, 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 I felt like I constantly sort of living in both universe and sometimes I do a lot of friends who are really into all kind of digital currency. It's almost religious. But having said that, I think that at the end of the day, majority of the population, if you have to sort of take your pick, do you believe in government or do you believe in Facebook? Or well, I don't, I actually think that many of the central bank or government will push back on the launch of any sort of digital currency that is not controlled by central bank. So in that sense, I really wish, you know, I actually is very supportive of the concept of Libra, but unfortunately I think like the way that they execute for now is I don't think they're thoughtful enough. Nico, I think uh, I'll ask you what you think are likely to be the next growth drivers of tomorrow because I think you mentioned fintech as one of the areas of interest for you and that could be a nice flow from what uh, Edith was talking about. Right. Uh, well, 
we did some exper experimentations with, uh, with MD Adventures back by, by Telkom Indonesia. Uh, and we realized that we haven't given much value added to the startups that we're investing in, except for those uh, with a um, you know with the core of a communications like Whisper or Web of, or, or WebCell. Um, but through BRI, um, we see some you know the lacking of financial inclusion across the country. And uh, if you see Tokopedia and uh, and Traveloka, uh, both of these startups need be a right to for, for further growth. Um, I guess uh, one of the key driver will be, you know, the financial inclusions that the the government give give mandates to uh, to all these government uh, state-owned banks uh, in Indonesia. They will fuel further consumerism in the in in, in the country, and um, I believe that. Um, the go the Gojek and and Grab becoming the Alibaba and Tencent of in the in the region, and they they provide somewhat an exit market for investors like like ourselves, because um, back then the 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 path to uh, liquidity was only IPO. Uh, I think this this both uh, recent key drivers that will you know leverage further growth in the region. Jeremy, to you. Uh, your fund specializes in B2B enterprise software. Where do you think, uh, in your opinion, are likely to be the, the growth drivers uh, of tomorrow? In So, um, there are a lot of trends. It comes and goes. You know, it's fintech, there's um, and, um, AI, there's machine learning. You know, this this uh, are the buzzwords now. And, and you know, we're nothing against them, but what we found that Evergreen and lasting trend is customer focus. You develop a solution your customer need, the traction will come. Everything else, your tech, your go-to-market strategy, your pricing are all enablers of that. So with that as the context, we look at uh, where the growth will come from is by extension focusing on the businesses that are prevalent in Southeast Asia and what are they? You know, people have made money on them, you know, banking, we have uh, commodities, supply chain, you have uh, uh, shipping and hospitality. Those are the customers you need to target. And we, visit, we, we believe in investing in tech that enables businesses uh, to solve their real problems. Right? So um, I'll give an example of that to just bring it to life. You know, we are bullish in IoT with the, you know, you know the trends, the hardware costs have come down, proliferation, proliferation, proliferation of that, and also um, many protocols have enabled the use case to be economical. Um, and one of the cases we're looking at is deployment in uh, oil and gas terminals where it's very flammable and very dangerous. Um, and it's a current topic now, given what happened uh, recently with the drones. Um, they are interested in tracking machineries, and also people moving out of sensitive facilities like, like this. Not just from a security standpoint, but also from a safety standpoint. The device is smart enough that when a person falls, they pick it up right away and they send a signal to where you get a location that's accurate up to a five meter radius. These are things that seem simple, but think about it in an environment like an oil and gas environment where traditional you know, devices like cell phone are not allowed to be used, right? It's through this um, trends we talk about that you know we begin to see use cases like that. And you, a lot of you took your flights here. Um, the airlines is, uh, serve you food in your food galley. Um, each airline, depending on the size, has hundreds, thousands of those floating around <laughs> somewhere in the world. They have no idea where they are. It gets shipped into the caterer, gets washed at high temperature. They want to know how many at one time, and what's the turnaround. And some of them are used by the haters to push things around. So they keep buying and buying, each one of them is $500 a pop, right? So you begin to see some use cases here that you don't hear about, but actually um, solves real, real, um, real business issue. And maybe just to sum up why enterprise tech, right? Um, we look at the space, if you look at since 1995, the capital return by enterprise tech to investors is two times that of consumer-based uh, tech. And uh, the former raise um, from, from, in terms of private capital, half the amount. So that, that's why you know, we think the next, well, a lot of attention on B2C uh, startups, 
B2B, we think it's the right time, and that's where we're going to see growth and drivers. Uh, uh, Jeremy, I'll, I'll uh, probably ask a bit more on that. Uh, one of the things that we as a fund struggle with is that you know we have, we have the privilege, uh, SG Innovate has the privilege of being an evergreen fund, and we invest in deep tech with the knowledge that we can hold it for extended periods of time. Obviously, commercial funds don't enjoy that same luxury. Most of you have eight years or two, uh, 811 or, or shorter to actually deliver returns to your LPs. Uh, so, Jeremy, how do you reconcile your interest or a very obvious uh, you know, uh, thesis in IoT and connected devices with the relatively short lifetime of a usual fund? One day I aspire to be you. <laughs> I don't think you but, do. But uh, no one, no one, no one has a benefit of uh, you know, having an evergreen fund all the time. But you know, uh, I get your question. So I think part of the reason why the three of us, um, before we quit our jobs and do this, we actually tested with our own capital to make sure it works. Because besides giving up the job, I report to my CIO at home, which is my wife. That why am I doing this? And one of the things we look at is make sure that we can exit and return capital to investors. Right. And we actually tested our own capital because taking your first dollar from your friends and family is a huge responsibility. And coming back to your question more directly, um, we find it, it's because of that that we started the process before raising an official fund using our own money. And we deploy it in startups. We work with them to help them go to market. Right? So one of the few drivers of exit is that you prove that you can go beyond the country of origin. Some of startups in Singapore, the demand is Southeast Asia. You know, the, 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 the prospects, it's obviously there, but how do you go about harnessing a fragmented market with different cultural um, nuances and so on? And I won't go into details, but we proved that we are able to help them accelerate out to Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on, and getting traction. As a function of that, and because their unit economics are positive day one, 75% above, they generate cash flow and become viable. Right? Um, so they don't need so much capital and to prove they are viable um, entities. And we've seen that we've got actual proof of demand for these startups from investors. So when we started the fund, within six months we got term sheet from um, in, uh, acquirers who wanted to purchase it, right? And mostly that comes from customers who have used the tech and realized that, huh, okay, this is interesting. Either they want to take it because they want to prevent it from their competitors taking it, um, or they say, look, this is such an integral part of my, my operation and I want it, right? That's not a guarantee, but to us, that's proof that um, we can exit it within the 10 year uh, time frame. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Um, and uh, finally, Nir, I'm sure you're going to be talking about how uh, you know the key drivers within the medical sector. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, healthcare is is the space I'm in. So um, um, yeah, I guess there are uh, a few key drivers around the world. Uh, so it, it depends on the geography as well. So uh, we all know that US was the key driver for many years, uh, and it seems though it's getting into that end. The expenditure, the US expenditure on um, Healthcare has uh, pretty much reached its limits. Um, and what we see is we see um, growth in the emerging markets in China. And what when it used to be, and still is, but it, it's probably going to change, that uh, the US was always the first to get any new drug or any new diagnostics. We see that significant change uh, trickling down into China and Southeast Asia, which is quite interesting. Um, other key drivers would be the aging population globally. So that would be a, a very um, globalized um, uh, driver that, that is uh, significantly going to change the way we uh, treat and the way we uh, uh, manage patients. Um, and I guess going into that is, is how to manage that and what, what we've seen in the last year is the, the uh, push into a very uh, patient-centric uh, sort of care. Uh, so we see uh, like previously said, that you know, rather than going B two B, a lot of companies go B two C. So, so healthcare needs to go the same way. Uh, so we are, and, and that's going to be quite a big change. Uh, so we see that with telemedicine, and that that doesn't matter in in what country we we see that more and more. So there's much more growth in that, um, and then in, into the more uh, personalized uh, diagnostics and treatment of of patients. Yeah. 
Um, given, I mean, we, we have met uh, many years ago when you were first starting Carmentex, so I think I'm quite familiar with uh, you know, what you do uh, over there. But I think the, the question I have for you is going to be a bit more broad-based, which is, uh, you know, we all know that regulatory hurdles are one of the biggest challenges for medtech startups. You know, getting to market, you know, they may have a drug that actually works uh, effectively, but unless they go through years of clinical trials, uh, even expedited, it still takes a long time to get to market. Uh, the example of Biolytics in Singapore that went IPO was a big story, but it took them 10 years and $50 million. So, um, realistically, if we look at uh, a time frame of 10 years, do you see a lot of new innovations or a lot of potential new uh, big companies uh, coming out uh, in this period of time? You mean in Singapore or globally? Well, I think, well, I'll be selfish. Let's look at Singapore. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, so I, I actually came to Singapore six years ago um, and there was maybe a handful of startups in, in the life science space and, and I would say there's probably 50, 60 startups today in that space. Um, where, I, where I see the biggest growth is actually in digital health and it's yet to be seen, but it seems that within digital health, um, that is where you're going to see sh uh, shorter intervals. Uh, in terms of the regulatory perspective, it's not going to change, right? It's still going to take six, seven, ten years for a company to make it into, uh, into a market and pass the regulatory hurdles, uh, especially in the pharmaceutical space. Um, diagnostic space, it's still as long. Usually it takes uh, five to ten years as well. Um, so if you're an investor in that space, you need the patience. Um, no, no way around it. Uh, so and I would say the only true exception would be in the digital health, where we see that uh, the, the, the time to collect the data use the data and develop a proper product and uh, the capital to generate those products is much, much shorter. Um, Regulatory-wise, there are still a lot of questions. So FDA has released uh, three, three, four months ago their perspective on how AI uh, would be implemented in a medical device. Um, so it's not that clear yet. So it's quite clear that they uh, do want to uh, look into AI and see how that would be implemented into medical devices. However, um, um, however, it, um, the, the, the final answer is not there yet. Okay. Uh, do, do you think cannabis will be a trend? Can cannabis is a trend. It's, it's a hype. It's, uh, it's like a, a, everywhere in the world. That's a method. Cannabis, cannabis companies. Uh, uh, it's, uh, that's okay, that's uh, not a question for me. <laughs> I, I'm not sure whether cannabis will ever take off in Singapore. Let's get it in first. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, sorry, Nico, you want to say something about the, the med techs? Uh, cannabis is a part of the medical thing. I don't know. What was it? It's it not a med tech, right? Yeah, it could definitely be construed as such. Uh, okay, so I mean, uh, we sort of deviated into looking at cannabis as a key uh, driver of uh, economic growth, but I don't think. Uh, uh, everyone was totally serious about that. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, back down to earth, Edith. Uh, let me ask you, your fund looks at blockchain, uh, obviously lots of hype, you know, people sometimes associate blockchain with cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, the, the, the peak of the hype cycle was probably a couple of years ago when every, you know, blockchain was going to save the world. It was, uh, you know, we had some, a good friend of mine is called the, the, the blockchain monk or something because he evangelizes it almost like a religion. Um, so what is the truth behind blockchain? Is it ever going to really gain the kind of traction uh, in the market as a useful technolo technological platform? Well, for, first and foremost, blockchain is not going to save the world. Uh, so let's start with that. And, and I think like a, a lot of times like when I talk to a lot of folks trying to explain blockchain, I don't think, like think about it, right? Who, on, on the consumer side, I think the consumer will never actually need to touch and feel because it's really a distributed database, right? If I'm playing games and I'm, if I'm, you know, B2B running the logistic healthcare records, or I'm not going to say, hey, are you building on a blockchain? So it's not like you add fries to that. Like have nothing to do with it. I think at the end of the day, I do absolutely think that in, in the world of like cryptography, uh, privacy, security, it will be an enabling technology. So what we've been actually focusing on as a fund, absolutely a lot of time we spend on like finance related because we absolutely believe there's a huge push on digital currency. So because of that, how do we actually protect that from a data point of view, security point of view, is a lot of like r r super boring infrastructure, like 
back end, things that like on the AWS level, and in, on top of that, hardware level, we started to look at a lot of like, chipset, like secure chipset, a lot of talent, particularly in China and Taiwan, that we found is super fascinating. So we, we want to invest in things that truly have a pain point and driver. Um, I don't want to like, you know, look at any deals that actually have VR plus blockchain plus AI combined, then I just run as far away as, as possible from, from those sort of deals. Okay, a whole bunch of them are going to come to you after this session. <laughs> uh, Nico, you, you, your thesis is founded around the, 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 the theory of financial inclusion. Um, as a thesis, obviously, that works, uh, you know, that resonates well within Indonesia being a country with you know, very disparate uh, you know, income levels, technological acceptance. What, what is your view on the region as a whole, Southeast Asian region? Well, when we talk Southeast Asia, I guess uh, it's Indonesia plus, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean obviously, uh, you, know, you guys heard rumors that Grab is moving headquarters into Indonesia. Uh, it is the, still the massive consumer market in the region. If you try to solve you know, even simple problems uh, in Indonesia and you get 10% tractions, it's 26 million easy. Uh, and then again, if you see uh, the, the trend of Tokopedia, uh, uh, Gojek, um, uh, Traveloka, uh, it's, all, it's, it's built on the foundation of uh, SMEs, right? 95% of Indonesia economy is, is, is based on uh, small, medium uh, enterprises. And uh, BRI has been financing SMEs since 125 years ago, before the independence of uh, uh, Indonesia. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, and, and still there's a lot of challenges uh, in the country. It's only 20, 20, 26, 30 percent banked populations. And uh, most of the people from the rural areas never got the, 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 the banking financial services as the urban uh, uh, populations. Um, so our, our thesis is, is built on the, that we can really give value added to our uh, startups that we're investing in. Because um, uh, again, uh, BRI had, and, and most of Indonesia banks like BCA, BRI, uh, BNI, we have the outreach uh, throughout the archipelago. And, uh, and, and, and our investees uh, could really benefit from it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jeremy, one question for you because uh, you're in the B2B space. Uh, obviously, you know the, the space very well. One of the biggest challenges for B2B startups is getting that first customer. Not getting that first POC. I mean, they do, you know, corporates are quite willing to do POCs with as many startups as it takes. But converting that to a production, you know, ready uh, kind of a contract for which uh, you know, the, the corporate is procuring now uh, services from that startup is, fine, is actually one of the most difficult challenges that you know, we have faced uh, in our portfolio uh, companies. So how, how do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's a, a very relevant question for us as we are dealing with that right now. Um, but we anticipated that before we started the fund because we had experience doing that. Uh, I think a few things. The, the, there are some very strong founders here, very strong in industry connection, right? They know exactly what they're going to solve, they have the contacts, they go in there and they pitch and they get a POC and which converts quickly. I think there are a few things. Even in that situation, um, enterprise sale is very different from responding to an RFP. You've got to take the customer through a funnel, it's a process. So in the first meeting, you establish as a need, in the next meeting, you start asking some of the tougher questions like, you know, do you, what's your budget? If I did this POC, what's your contract size, right? And why are all this important? Because you want to make sure that you don't waste your time and your resources running down rabbit holes that's never going to convert, right? So that's one control you have over. You weed them out very quickly. Um, the other aspect which um, some of our startups who um, uh, who may not come from industry or may not, uh, will be younger, we don't have the, uh, the, 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 the network. Um, we find that it's important as an investor, especially at this early stage of this ecosystem, to not just be passive investors. Um, we have developed a, a system um, where it's a three-tier relationship. 
Like first tier is the government, the deep heart, the ESGs of the world, um, where um, they are interested in new technology coming in. Um, so I'll take you that using an example to illustrate what we do. So one of the companies that we invested in, it's a ag tech business, and they want to bring it to Thailand, which we all know it's a quite a close market. And Deep Heart looked at it and said, look, okay, interesting. Um, can you help me solve my issue with uh, rice farming? Because the GDP still depends on that, but people are moving away from rural areas to urban areas. How do I maintain or increase the productivity? So we pair up with university, we have got data, use IoT, and prove that um, definitively. So we got them that POC. And from then, Deepak did what they did, which is to publicize that very widely within Thailand to, to, to drive adoption. And one of the clients, Sun Suite, heard about them, and that's how they secured 20, the first 20 hectares. Right? And once you have a name like Sun Suite, which is the hardest to get, you prove your value, you then have the credentials to roll out other customers. And finally, once you have that, you work with channel partners. Right. Channel partners who are interested say, I, you have a solution here, I'll white label that and I'll sell that to customers that we otherwise would, it would, be, uh, would be difficult, not economical for us to reach out to. Right? Um, so that's our approach to help um, drive adoption and help uh, our startup increase their chances of uh, you know, acquiring the first customer. Right. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, yeah. Asking you a bit more questions on the medtech space, and I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you, having been in Singapore for the last six years, what do you think is still missing in the Singapore ecosystem that will enable Singapore to actually have a, well, a, a re relatively more successful pipeline of companies going out into the market from the medtech's perspective? Um, so, yeah, that is a bit on the spot, but... Um, uh, I guess, I guess what Singapore tried to do beginning 10, 15 years ago is to do uh, build it uh, top down to bring in all the uh, big MNCs uh, and uh, to build up a star and 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 to uh, strengthen all the university to generate much more uh, knowledge base uh, to build up startup companies or or, or build up the, the the knowledge to. Uh, generate technologies in, in the life science space. Um, I, I think uh, what people didn't realize that it does take some time. So this knowledge base takes more than a year or two and it's not just bringing the, the top researchers around the world. It's, it's uh, life science and, and academics have, have a history for a reason. Uh, I think Singapore has finally reached that level of um, uh, capability to generate um, Early, early stage technologies. So we do see that within the academics. We see that in all academics, uh, whether NUS, NTU, uh, ASTAR. Um, so we see um, a lot of technologies coming up. Um, and now it seems like the strategy has changed, building it uh, bottom up um, uh, in, in the sense that um, bringing in more investors into Singapore. So that, I think, would be the missing link Currently, uh, we have met with quite a few global investors in the last six months that are looking into coming into Singapore and, and looking at the technologies to invest. So hopefully in a year or two, this will change. Okay, we don't have much time left, so I'm just going to go around uh, my fellow panelists and just have each of them tell me what they think. In over the next 10 years, what, where would they put their money? Which technology would they put their money behind? And I can start with ladies first. Really? <laughs> of, course, of course, for me, absolutely, block, blockchain and cryptocurrency, I actually absolutely do believe in Bitcoin. And I have a couple of things I do want to throw it in, in addition to what I would invest. Um, we are sitting in Singapore, and I do actually think that there is a lot of, a lot of more and more, particularly in Southeast Asia and India, there will be a more a China playbook than a U.S. Pay, playbook and have everything to do with not just more for habit and sort of the nature of the population, have everything to do with because when young people, there's a large population of young people, they like to play games and entertainment. And when there are more and more like married couples, then you want to shop more 
and there's sort of the Tencent and Alibaba, and I absolutely think that there are more and more in Southeast Asia, in addition to Indonesia, I think Vietnam is also interesting, that you know, I'm absolutely, there's a lot of things to learn, super fascinating. Okay, thanks, Edith. Uh, Nia, quickly. What is the best what, thing? What, what is the technology you will put your money behind? Oh, I think whatever comes after AI. So I think AI is almost there, and, and I think the next generation would be probably the one that makes it. Okay. Uh, okay, Nico, maybe you go first. Oh, well, <laughs> well, if you're not investing in fintech already, I mean, you will never see unicorn in your, your portfolio. Uh -huh. uh, the window is closing rapidly. It's, uh, it's, it's about two or three years. Um, and it, and, and it will be another consolidation, just like e-commerce play. Uh, the next sector will be O2O, um, and we heard rumors that SoftBank is investing in in Edutech, uh, like Ruang Guru or something. And I guess uh, right after uh, new retail O2O, it will be somewhat education technology and healthcare. Okay, thanks, Nico. Jeremy, last words yeah, to sure. wrap it up. I mean, I will absolutely ask you to put money in Tin Man. <laughs> Yes, a totally impartial point of view. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, you know we could give our uh, fellow panelists a round of applause. Thank you.